The next session we have is talking about the role of philanthropy in today's changing world. Um, a lot of people saw this on the agenda and asked me, how does this even fit? What's the relevance? You're, you're talking about lots of other stuff relating to financial markets. How does this even get to be relevant in today's agenda? Well, I, I, my answer to that is very simple. How can we not have this on today's agenda? Now, look, we spend a lot of time on this forum talking about high-level stuff, you know, regulation, asset management, uh, banking, financing trends, etc., etc. But hang on, let's just slow down a second. Just press the pause button, and then we start to realize that whether we talk about the West East Corridor or any other geography, these countries have some fundamental problems. Whether you look at Africa, you look at the Middle East, you look at India, China, other parts of Asia, there are some serious grassroots level fundamental problems such as illiteracy, poverty, human trafficking, education, the lack of women in the workforce, etc. These are really grassroots level problems. If we don't address these, what's the point in talking about all the high level stuff? So the panel we've put together today here is four foundations that are doing a lot of good work to try and address some of these types of issues. Four foundations that are actually committing themselves to try to make a difference. There's four people here that can really tell us a lot about what we should be doing, how we can change our thinking, and perhaps how we can end up with the world as a better place. So moderating this panel, we have a dear friend of ours, Mr. David Gibson Moore. He's founder, sorry, he's from the LGT Foundation. And he's going to be moderating the session. And I'll let him introduce his three panelists. So perhaps we could ask David Gibson Moore and the panelists to come on stage. Over to you. Great to see you. Nice to see you. Please. Hello. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of us all, I would like to say what a great pleasure it is to be with you and to have this uh, opportunity of discussing this very important topic of future of philanthropy. I'd like to first introduce our highly distinguished uh, panelists from left to right. Firstly, we have Monique Villar. Uh, Monique is the CEO of Thomson Reuters Foundation and the founder of Trust Law and Trust Women. She has been ranked amongst the world's 100 most influential business pe people in ethics by Ethisphere. Uh, since her appointment in 2008, she has strengthened the foundation's commitment to free and independent journalism. The foundation's editorial team covers issues that mainstream media often forget, such as human rights uh, issues and abuses. The foundation also delivers journalistic training and media development projects across the globe and undertakes research into news media through the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University. Trust Law is dedicated to the practice of promoting pro bono legal work and Trust Women is a fast growing movement to help empower women and to combat slavery and human trafficking worldwide. Uh, next, we um, have uh, Tamar Makari. Uh, Tamar is executive director of the Maghrebi Foundation, which is the Middle East's first social purpose organization established to track, tackle the serious problem of avoidable blindness. The foundation is committed to providing a sustainable model for high quality eye care and actively promoting the inclusion of those living with visual impairment. Uh, he also serves as the Vice President of the Africa Eye Foundation, a Geneva-based social enterprise charged with forging strategic partnerships and fundraising to support and promote better eyesight. Tama previously held a distinguished clear career as an investment banker, so here's a direct link, <laughs> specializing particularly in frontier and emerging markets. And he was recognized for his work in 2008 
by being awarded the Banker Magazine's European Islamic Finance Deal of the Year. And thirdly, certainly not uh, least, Claire Woodcroft Scott. Uh, Claire is the Chief Executive Officer of Emirates Foundation, a key national foundation here in the UAE, and is responsible for driving the vision of supporting youth development in the country. In her role as CEO, she's overseen the transition of the foundation from a traditional grant-making entity to one focused on guiding, inspiring, and empowering young people. Prior to joining Emirates Foundation, Claire was Deputy Director of the Shell Foundation, working on building social enterprises to help address global development challenges. And she's also previously head headed the Visa International public affairs arm in emerging markets. This saw her working closely with governments and financial sectors in Africa and the Middle East, whilst investigating the important socio-economic development associated with electronic payments. Claire has also worked in Palestine for various development agencies and contributed to several academic studies on the issue of socio-economic development. So the future of philanthropy, it's a critical issue for millions, if not hundreds of millions of people in the world today. And I think it's particularly appropriate that we have this discussion in the Emirates here, which has the highest level of aid of a, as a percentage of GNP of any country in the world. And that was recently announced in this very building as part of the UAE Foreign Aid Report recently. Uh, internationally, however, philanthropy landscape has been changing fast. And each of our panelists has been playing a key role in these developments. So in order to get our discussion going, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to describe in greater detail their work uh, at their own organizations, and especially within the context of the major issues uh, confronting philanthropy at the present moment. So Claire, could I start with you? Um, the mission of the Emirates Foundation focuses on empowering and guiding the youth of the UAE. You also work in partnership with both the private and the public sectors. I know that you went through an extensive exercise a while back to define your mission, refocus resources, and establish core strategies. And this involved engaging stakeholders right across the board. Could you tell us a little bit more about how this exercise worked with your organization? What were the various steps you took implementing this process? Absolutely. Thank you, David, and thanks to the National Bank of Abu Dhabi for inviting me to be here. Um, so I will indeed very briefly describe our transition, our transformation, but I just wanted to note that what we have witnessed at Emirates Foundation is very similar to what we see happening globally. In this 21st century, in this beginning of the digital revolution, we see that there is a fundamental paradigm shift in the way that philanthropic capital is deployed. This is now a huge and growing market. Uh, Matthew Bishop estimates that there's over $1 trillion worth of philanthropic capital. And of course, we're seeing that grow in the region, notably with family offices looking to deploy uh, capital philanthropically. And this shift is really uh, quite a structural one. I would call it transformation, if not a revolution, where the days of check writing are over. When you have this level of scrutiny of where philanthropic funds are being deployed, the onus on philanthropists and on foundations to be fully accountable is only going to grow. And we are seeing now, as we engage in various uh, global and regional platforms, that there is a real shift from traditional grant-making philanthropy, often short-termist, often multi-sectored, to looking at a much more focused approach to deploying this capital and really creating social value. And the principles around that, how one creates social value, are very similar to how one creates commercial value. <laughs> Hence, there's a real hybrid model starting to emerge where traditional foundations are adopting the principles that one would apply in a commercial uh, organization. This relates to uh, 
measuring output as opposed to just input, really looking at cost efficiencies, cost effective, the social return on your investment, whether you are deploying your capital more effectively than other organizations might, how you're working in collaboration with partnerships, and ultimately ensuring that you're actually having an impact. And I would argue that still too much philanthropic capital, too many foundations are deploying funds without actually being able to measure, scale up, or assess the sustainability of their impact. Now, we underwent a transition over three years ago now where we followed a similar path. So we were a traditional grant-making organization where we were working in multiple sectors and in the main issuing short-term grants. We were also very much, the competencies inside our organization were very much focused on administration, administration of a grant portfolio. And we were ultimately not able to articulate our aggregate impact or output. So what we did at Emirates Foundation is we phased out in its entirety our grant making model. We felt that making 12 to 18 month investments in third party organizations simply wasn't creating a sufficient level of social value in a sustainable form. So we went from being grant making to being operation. In other words, deploying that capital within our own teams and within our own programs. We went from being multi-sector to focusing on just one single issue youth development. And we chose that focus area based on what others in the market were doing and what we felt was one of the most important socioeconomic areas in the UAE and of course for the region. Um, and we also ensured that the focus that we chose was in line with our expertise, was an area where we could deliver value and that would complement government policies in that area. So we now have only six programs. We do no random ad hoc project initiatives. We focus on each one of those programs. Each program responds to what we call a gap in the market. So we believe this is market-based philanthropy. And each one is looking to solve a particular challenge that young people are facing, including, for example, helping young people to become more financially literate helping them to get into jobs, helping them to build their leadership skills, helping them to be engaged members of the community. And our focus now is on running each one of those six programs as if it were a small business, as if it were a startup entity, looking at our impact, our output, our cost effectiveness. Can we create economies of scale? How much does it cost us per youth? Can we do this youth development thing more efficiently and more effectively than government? Because if we can't, we shouldn't. Can we collaborate? So we deploy philanthropic capital from the private sector. We leverage the government's investment in us in order to create our portfolio. So we're really running the foundation in a business-based fashion. And we believe that that has allowed us to make a very significant improvement in the level of social impact that we can generate. We have a scorecard so we can aggregate our output at the end of the year. We can be held accountable to our board of trustees. We are increasingly building capacity in our team to transition them from being grant administrators to being entrepreneurs, to being innovative in what they do. And we firmly believe that this kind of philanthropy, what we call venture philanthropy, what others call catalytic philanthropy or strategic philanthropy, is an inevitability that in this world of scrutiny and of transparency through the digital space, foundations are no longer going to be able to adopt this spray and pray mechanism whereby they are offering short-term funding to multiple organizations with no real focus and no real ability to measure outcomes. And we welcome that trend. Thank you very much, Graham. Just a quick follow-up. How did you manage the process of transition? What sort of internal uh, consultations did you have with mm -hmm. stakeholders and shareholders in your very important uh, foundation? Well, I would say in a nutshell, it was all about that. So it was a very significant change management program and pretty much everything we did was around consultation. Mm -hmm. So talking to our beneficiaries, talking to our historical investors, talking to our board, talking to academia, talking to youth, talking to some of the third parties we'd worked with in the past, and most importantly to the team. So we have a team of around 100 people, and it was really important that they understood right. how we were going to build on their existing work and why we were undergoing this transition. And in the main, if you talk to people and say, well, would you rather we carry on doing relatively low impact things, Absolutely. or would you prefer that we create long-term systemic change and change people's lives permanently? There's very few people who will disagree with that. Thank you very much. Um, Moni, could I turn to you? I mean, your own work at the Thomson Reuters Foundation is global rather than uh, regional. 
uh, you're also sponsored by a large corporation. Uh, I know you've spoken extensively of the role of business in society and the concept of connecting a company's success with social progress, sometimes referred to under the caption of strategic philanthropy. Could you tell us more <coughs> about your activities at the foundation uh, and expand on some of these themes and particularly how you see the relationship between philanthropy and business development? I think it's a very big relationship. I mean, I've been a journalist for 20 years, then I was uh, managing Agence France Presse, and then I was the managing director of the Reuters news agency. When in 28, Thompson acquired Reuters, and they asked me to take the foundation, the Reuters mm -hmm. foundation, transform it in something that would give a culture to the company. And I did just like Claire, I, I, I consulted for a long time. I was not at all a charity person, I'm a businesswoman, and I run the, the, the Thomson Reuters Foundation as a business. Uh, what I learned is that if you give small grants, and the Reuters Foundation was giving small grants with not a lot of metrics, it would not have a big impact. Mm -hmm. Where if you use the skills of the company and the values of the company, then you can have impact. So looking at Thomson Reuters, we, 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 I, I was just thinking of the shared value we could share, and I think that um, business is, the role of business in society it is not different from the philanthropy. Business can, we can reconnect business and philanthropy. And so if you take some of the, the businesses of Thomson Reuters, like the legal business, for instance, um, I was looking into that and what could we do? And someone I met, a lawyer I met in Washington DC told me, Monique, I created the Pro Bono Institute in Washington 30 years ago. And the concept that the law firms in America would give minimum the equivalent of 2.5% of their revenue in share in free hours for people who could not afford a lawyer. When you know the turnover of the big American law firm, it's a lot of money that they give with their brand instead of with their uh, money or check. So I said, this is fabulous, and is it the same all over the world? And he said, no, no, not at all. It's just in a few countries that it is organized. So the idea came to me to create the marketplace to spread the practice of pro bono worldwide. I launched it in July 2010. In four years, the, we have now 470 law firms member, plus all the big corporations like Goldman Sachs, like HSBC, like General Electric, like Vodafone, etc., who are members. The big corporations, because they have army of lawyers and they are very happy to find cases in countries where they never had pro bono cases before. Uh, the big law firms and the small law firms in every country, because now we operate in 170 countries mm -hmm. in, in four years. Um, are happy to work on global cases and to help all the social entrepreneurs and the, the, the NGOs that we vet at the foundation to make sure that they are not dodgy or cover for anything that would not please a law firm. So the, 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 the trust law program, uh, the law, law firms told us that in four years they spent 74, uh, 54 million dollars to our beneficiaries through trust law. This is an impact I would never have got myself. But to go into really what impact means, which is all I am about, um, if you take, for instance, uh, Visayan Forum, this is an NGO in the Philippines. Uh, they, are, they are dealing with human trafficking and with domestic labor. And they wanted to do advocacy on the domestic labor in their country to have a law voted. So we put it a, a program on trust law to look at 12 countries, what were the best law regarding domestic labor. Then White and Case took the, to the, to the, the, the program and studied it, and we published the, the research. Visayan Forum in the Philippines went to do their advocacy with the president, the prime minister, all the MPs. And after um, uh, all that process, the Magna Carta on domestic labor was voted in the Philippines. It has changed the, work, the life mm -hmm. of two million workers in the Philippines that were paid peanuts and now have a minimum wage, etc. 
So you, have, you can have very big impacts through putting the rule of law behind, uh, behind organizations. The second, the second thing that we did, thinking of what the company does and how we could complete that, was we are very good at journalism, Reuters, so we train journalists around the world, but we also have now our team of journalists at the foundation, and we cover the underreported stories. So it means human rights, women's rights, uh, human trafficking and slavery, human impact of climate change. And this is published on Reuters Wise, so it goes far, and on Reuters Financial Terminal, so the impact is big. Last but not least is a conference called Trust Women, where we put the rule of law behind women's rights, and we take action to do that. So just one action, because we are the financial markets here, was um, uh, to to convince the American banks, the biggest American banks, that uh, looking at the credit card of their clients, they could easily found, find patterns of human traffickers. So I co-hosted a working group with Cyrus Vance, who is the Manhattan District Attorney, the prosecutor for New York. And uh, the biggest banks in the U US agreed to put, to incorporate in their software um, the red flags that the NGOs specialized in human trafficking uh, had designed for them. Mm -hmm. And since Cyrus Vance came back to my conference last year to say the number of suspicious reports has increased considerably in New York. And these are no small banks, it's Citigroup, it's Bank of America, it's JP Morgan Chase, it's Wells Fargo, TD Bank, and um, Barclays. So you can have impact through charity in ways that you, you, you would never thought if you were not working in that world. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Um, Tamar, if I could pass to you. I know you believe uh, strongly in the role of the private sector and the role it plays in social development. Um, however, you work with governments a lot. Um, you sometimes come across a lot, lack of flexibility and inability perhaps to react fast enough. However, you support ministries in terms of capacity building, uh, training of doctors and other medical staff, as well as refurbishment of public hospitals. Uh, you see your non-profit uh, hospital in Yaoundé, I believe, as a model for future development. Could you let us know more about your foundation's work and particularly how you see the role of foundations working with governments in the developing world? Sure. Thank you, and thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, I think the first thing that I'd love to start with is just to qualify my own perspective and potentially add on to um, one major theme that's coming out of the other two panelists' discussion, which is the fact that the commercial and the philanthropic are no longer mutually exclusive. Um, and I think that's something that means especially a great deal to us and to the work that we're doing at Maghrabi, because I head up the foundation's efforts um, uh, in Egypt and the work that we're doing in Cameroon, as you note. And I also serve as the chief development officer of the business. Um, and that marriage and that unification goes a long way in, in furthering some of the work that we do in the philanthropic, <laughs> philanthropic sphere. Um, just to answer your question, I think the, the premise of cooperation is very much a public-private partnership um, whose returns are socially sustainable. Um, and they're optimized with impact and outcome in mind. Um, the private sector leverages its business savvy uh, and in tackling various issues, be it financial literacy, um, uh, legal issues, or in our, in our case, eye care. And the government uh, certainly can ease the obstacles that are traditionally associated with operations and facilitates a, a business-friendly context. Um, we all know that, that governments can make or break um, the best intentions. Um, they can pave the way for success or they can alternatively deal a knockout blow. Um, managing a sensitive and dynamic relationship is of the utmost importance. Understanding the area and or areas that we focus, um, that we dedicate our efforts for, and respecting local customs and traditions are paramount. Um, the key there for us is obviously, apart from the, the respect that should go, it should be outright, um, is that focus. 
for us to do our work in eye care, it's a very logical step because most of our commercial work is in eye care. It's what we know best. It's where we can add the most value and where we can deliver what I like to know is what I like to call Robin Hood technologies that just turn the, the industry upside down. Um, there's really very little to no room for selfish ego. Um, the government, the country, uh, the people, they need to share in the pride and success of the project. Any initiative has to be collaborative in nature and create a sense of localized empowerment. And I think even the panel before us was talking quite a bit of the localization. Um, and if you consider us, the Maghrabi Group's a Saudi Egyptian family group. We've now raised more than $7 million um, into the, our non-for-profit subspecialty eye hospital in, in Yaoundé, in Cameroon, um, to provide affordable, high-quality eye care and to increase local capacity. And many times we get the question of, well, why Cameroon? Um, and for us, it's just need. There's absolutely no other reason. There's no commercial interest, there's no profit, um, just the demand for the necessary service of what we, and personally I, consider to be an inalienable right, which is the right to see. Um, from my experiences, um, humble as they are, um, I think governments and, and government officials um, tend to actually appreciate pure and honest integrity and, 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 uh, and uh, intentions, and more often than not, provide more than adequate support, which we continue to get in Egypt, and which we also have gotten a tremendous amount of support from, from, from the Cameroonians. I hope that helps. Was the Yaoundé initiative a really a, a first for you? Do you think it could solve as a, so a role model for you and other institutions? Yeah, the, um, the, the model, it, it's something that's obviously been proven and done really well in places like India with the Aravind eye mm -hmm. care system. Um, the model is built on a cross-subsidization model um, where, you know, customarily in the Western world, a cataract surgery could be a few thousand dollars. Um, and we've managed to get the cost of a cataract surgery, including consumables and doctor's time and equipment and depreciation of equipment, rent of the building down to $45. So when we're able to charge a discounted rate of $120, $125 for a patient that can afford, um, we're able to do two surgeries on the back of that. So the long-term strategy for the mm -hmm. Africa Eye Foundation is certainly to build a network of non-for-profit subspecialty hospitals. And it's underlied by the fact, just to be very, very clear, in case it's not clear to the audience, that you know, there are approximately 40 million people who are blind 80% of which it's avoidable and it's, it's preventable. So it really just becomes an ethical imperative that we all do our best to make sure that that doesn't happen just from a human, a human standpoint. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose it's fair to say that if you like to characterize it as the new style of philanthropy, there's a, a very great um, enhancement of engagement um, from foundations and from donors to the enterprises they're supporting. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Claire. I know that with the Emirates Foundation, high engagement has been institutionalized uh, to the extent that your programs are incubated in-house and you have shared resources such as human resource and IT and so on to support each of these uh, programs and your engagement period will particularly be over a, a lengthy period of time. Mm -hmm. could, could you comment on, on that as an enhancement vis-a-vis -vis the previous process that you Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on a point that Tamer made. We were talking about catalytic philanthropy versus venture philanthropy versus strategic philanthropy, and I'd like to add ego-free philanthropy as another great way of uh, driving more efficient social investment. I think uh, you know, there's too much of this in the philanthropic sector of the feel-good factor, as opposed to, did I really create an impact that is sustainable, that will still be there 5, 10, 15 years? And I think that relates to your point, David, that we believe 
that if you're not doing something long term, you're probably wasting your time. And again, back to Monique's point, if you're giving out a grant for 12 months and you think you're going to solve a health issue or a youth issue, then uh, you're kidding yourself. So mm -hmm. we are looking at long term systemic solutions. And we're looking at solutions. Again, if your philanthropic endeavors are not actually creating a real change, like Tama's example of you know, actually giving people access to eye care, you need to start radically thinking about is your foundation really fit for purpose? And we've had some interesting conversations at our regular philanthropy forums where we've talked about sunset clauses for foundations. You know, that If you're not able to deliver impact, then really should you be doing it? Mm -hmm. Because too often you can create liabilities with philanthropic finance if you're not generating real impact. And how we go about ensuring that's not the case, we are operational, so we don't just give out funding to third parties anymore. We run our own programs. They are run like businesses. And we engage the private sector and the government. So our programs are funded by the private sector. But we don't go to a corporate and say, can we have a check, please, in order to fund our activities this year. We go to the corporate and say, what are your commercial objectives? What are you trying to achieve as a commercial organization here in the UAE? Are you interested in developing local talent? Are you interested in licensed to operate? Are you interested in building your reputation? Are you interested in understanding the local economy and the local market better so that you can grow your portfolio? And most of the time they say yes, and we say, well, we have a value proposition for you. So if you engage with us in a long-term relationship, so we always encourage our corporates to look at long-term funding, multi-year funding, and then we ask them to engage with us as real partners. So their employees get involved with our programs, their executives can become motivational speakers, they can become mentors. We have an internship program where we can deploy local talent into the private sector. And I think if you have philanthropy where it's not hands-on and you don't have collaboration, again, you're probably wasting your time. Thank you very much. I'm sure everyone will buy into that. Um, Monique, could I just pick up on one point that um, you raised? Um, that is your relationship with your sponsoring entity. Um, there perhaps are people in this audience, and we have many business leaders who might be considering setting up some sort of philanthropic uh, giving activity within their own organization. How would you frame your relationship with Thomson Reuters Corporation? We, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question, because indeed, Thomson Reuters financed the foundation um, uh, up to $6 million. Mm -hmm. And the, the programs that we have now, uh, I spend more or less the double. So, so what I do is I fundraise for all the rest. And I, I do, as Claire said, I, 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 when I fundraise, uh, I always ask for long-term impact. So the, it's not for one year, it's for two years, for three years, etc. And so uh, a lot of family business, of people share the same value as us and, and um, are, are ready to help. But also a few corporations like GE, like others, who are also happy, many law firms, uh, seeing what we have done with Trust Law, mm -hmm. not trust us and, and help us develop more, etc. So this is, this is very interesting that they, 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 they come to us to, to help us finance what we do because we share the same values and we share the, the, the same view of what is impact and what is uh, making mm -hmm. a difference. Something I forgot to say before, but I think it's very important, is a, is a report that was published last year by Deloitte. And this is in relation with the, the, the young generation and, and uh, the, the, the so-called millennials. Uh, young generation, the people under 30 believe that the number one purpose of business is to benefit society and to solve critical issues such as income inequality, climate change, and corruption. This is huge because it means that um, uh, the young people will ask us, as corporation, businesses, and charities, what did you do? And what, what do you do? The same report showed that 50% of the world's young adults want to work for a business with ethical practices and are convinced that traditional politics is not doing enough to achieve social change. Mm -hmm. So the role of corporations, the role of government, of course, is very important. But where government can take a lot of time, a corporation can go very fast if they want. 
and, and they can change politics very quickly if they see that it is damaging their brand or whatever. So the, this link between business and charity is crucial for it's me. Crucial. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we, we've touched on the idea of um, venture philanthropy, and the analogy is partially that with venture capital. And I, I think anyone studying modern philanthropy will immediately come across an extended lexicon of, of terms. For instance, angel philanthropy, which is used to draw the analogy with startup uh, venture capital. Patient capital, which is designed to highlight numerous factors, such as long-term investment, a higher risk appetite, and perhaps uh, an initial acceptance of below market returns with the trade-off of a higher social uh, impact. And smart subsidy is sometimes used as a term as well to emphasize the impact value. Uh, Tamu, you're uh, an investment banker. Do you relate to these terms in your own internal discussions at the Maghrebi sure. Foundation? Sure. And uh, to be honest with you, regardless of the new or the old definition, uh, it's, I mean, for me, philanthropy is, is, is building sustainable social enterprises. So there's, there's real no, there, there's no active differentiation in, in, in my head. And when you talk about sources of funding, because that becomes the second kind of question that comes after, okay, well, now that you have the, the term for it, how do you raise money for it? Um, it, it becomes more a product of um, the, 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 the potential donors, the potential funders are, are out there. Um, and, and there's a lot more than you, that you can get out of those funders from their active participation and from being able to give them more proof of accountability and measurable, sure. um, you know, measurable outcomes. So we're not, it's, not a, it's not a transformation in that we have to you know, re-educate the population. The population's out there. Money is not the issue. The issue is actually more human capital. Um, so I'd like to think that the direct link to the audience today is that there's hope for us all. I mean, I was a born again, I suppose, investment <laughs> banker that found um, something else to do. Um, so I think I think that's really the the trick. It's 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 not so much a, a financial issue, but a, but a human capital issue. Um, and regardless of what you call it, um, building socially sustainable enterprises, you can make a ton of money doing it. It doesn't have to be, you know, the antithesis of, of not making money, and there's plenty sure. of examples out there. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, I, I suppose um, one phenomenon that's been much commented on the press has been the uh, transfer that we've seen in recent years of wealth to private hands, and um, the fund gathering activity is obviously very important for all foundations. I don't know, Claire, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about how, if at all, you are working on extending your fundraising activity, and particularly amongst private uh, donors, mm -hmm. um, or perhaps uh, private donors that have incorporated themselves in foundations, I mean, such as the... Yes, absolutely. And just before, I just want to pick up on a point that Tamar mentioned. I was at a, a, a meeting of a bunch of foundations in London just a few days ago, and uh, I found it quite disturbing that we started the conversation by saying, Today we're talking specifically about impact-oriented philanthropy. And the lady who was presenting then went into a detailed discussion about what that meant. And I said, but are we suggesting that the rest of philanthropy should be zero impact or indeed liability creating? So I think you know, what all of us are saying here is that, that you know, this sector needs to fundamentally shift and adopt the principles of accountability and focus and effectiveness that you would find in the commercial sector. Um, and, and when you do that, of course, it makes your fundraising platform more successful. Because sure. when I go to corporate sure. partners and I say to them, you know what, we're interested in value creation. We're interested in delivering a value proposition to you. We want to make sure that every single dollar of philanthropic capital that we invest generates a social return. Not necessarily a financial one, but when you start moving into the social enterprise space, also a financial one. And sure. that's fine, that's great. So I think the language of philanthropy is changing for all the right reasons. Sometimes I have people challenge me and say, are you trying to turn philanthropy into a profit-making initiative? And I say, I'm trying to make sure that philanthropic capital creates real value, that it's not wasted. And unfortunately, historically, too much of it was. And if you look at even corporate philanthropy, which I've been involved in in the past, 
Too often you had corporations where when they were undertaking their commercial operations were hugely focused on cost per unit, economies of scale, and real value outcomes. And yet when you turned to their social investment or their CSR portfolio, right. Right. They, all they measured was how much they spent. And the only accountability was did you spend your CSR budget this year? without any questions around impact. And that's inside the same organization. And I find this really shocking, that commercial individuals, for some strange reason, when they start to look at social or philanthropic investments, just lose all connection to accountability and transparency and outcome-based investing. And I think that's what we're all saying here, is that you know, philanthropy is a great thing. It needs to continue. It will continue. Many, uh, many entities in the region, family offices, are now looking to invest, looking to create foundations. And there is a real recognition that the days of check writing are over. Those investments have to generate real outcomes and a real return. Not necessarily financial, but it could be. Thank you very much. Yeah, and profit. Money, yeah. And profit mm -hmm. is important. I mean, we have, we have had these last two years big conversations with law firms on, on, on this. Can you help for free social enterprises which are for profit or not? And the answer is, of course, yes. They should help them, and they do, because uh, as long as the social enterprise reinvests the profits into a, the company to do social good then, and social progress, uh, the, the law firms do that. So there was a big discussion, on, you know, philosophical discussion on it, but the reality is for profit or not for profit, as long as it is used in a, in a clever manner to, to, to drive social progress, it should. Thank you very much. Um, we've still got a few more minutes uh, left, and I know um, our panelists would uh, welcome any, any questions at all. I think it's a very good opportunity to raise some points with some leading uh, practitioners uh, in the industry. Um, and indeed, I'm sure some of you have uh, some war stories, uh, recent challenges, or great successes you may have uh, had in this field, and we'd be delighted to take any questions. Yep. Please. Secretary. Can we have a microphone? But I thought you were a little too rough on grant making because, uh, for example, uh, I was on the Board of Governors of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and they needed funds to not only run hundreds of programs, but by getting grants, by getting money from corporations, large sums, we were able to create 3,000 new clubs. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to be a little cautious because a lot of the grants that are given out to worthy organizations that are achieving the purpose you have in mind need those grants or else they dry up. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to clarify. So absolutely. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not saying grants are a bad thing. Absolutely not. And I should clarify that the financial mechanism that we use to run our programs is still grants. What I was suggesting from, I think it's more when I say grant making often tends to be a high transaction cost uh, initiative when, when you talk more about social investment and long-term investments, it tends to create more impacts. But the tool of a grant absolutely should not disappear because a lot of uh, organizations and entities, particularly social enterprises, need that uh, patient capital at the beginning so that they can start yeah. up and achieve, which they wouldn't get through commercial finance. However, I would say that what is interesting now in the sector is we are seeing a shift away from grants as a financial yeah, instrument yes. to loan guarantees and, of course, even to equity. And I would encourage philanthropists to absolutely have a grant making uh, or a grant portion of their portfolio, but also to look at other financial tools which might be more effective in terms of uh, long-term support. But thank you. Yeah, Monique, and it's a very good point, I must say, because we need grants uh, and, and we use grants a lot. All that comes with grants, and which is very interesting, is the metrics part of it. And, and if the metrics are well done, it, it, it's a fantastic thing. Sometimes with grants, you have metrics which are 
keeping people busy doing the metrics rather than doing the job they should be doing with grants. And this is a negative impact. And I know of very big foundations, we have crazy metrics for small social enterprise, small NGOs who die of it. So it has, it has to be a balance. Yeah. And just to, just to add to this point, in our experience in Cameroon, every dollar that we've raised has been, has been grant money. And it was incredibly important yeah. in order to achieve sustainability in a quicker period of time that that startup capital not be related to interest, debt, anything. And in fact, one more step on the grant is that the grant is the birthplace of the development bond, um, right. where you take two groups that want to do a grant giving, yeah. but you make it tied to performance metrics, which is the most amazing form of, of, of yeah. finance, where it doesn't come at a cost, you're guaranteed a performance metric. Um, so it, it, it's kind of the birthplace of that, and I think that'll maybe the very future of grant giving is, is something uh, developed around the de development bond, but super important during yeah. a startup phase, yeah. like you mentioned. We were talking about this. Uh, yeah, this absolutely. Aspect. So it's, it's the how. So again, just, I'm mm. not against the grant per se, but yeah. the, the how you do it. Is it effective? Does it have metrics? Thank you. That is your patient capital that you were talking about that we right. still uh, desperately need. I think there are other questions. Yes. yes. In fact, if there's any grant givers out there. Have we any more questions? Well, I've got another question. <laughs> um, crowdfunding is a little bit on the screen at the moment. Um, how does our panel feel? Does this really open up in due course as a major source of finance? Um, or is it um, the flavor of the month that's going to go away pretty quickly, do you think? I, I look, we've looked at crowdfunding. I absolutely think it's only going to grow. I think it's almost the democratization of finance, if you like, ultimately may disintermediate aspects of the financial sector. Um, uh, it's still quite nascent, though, and my understanding from others that have used it, it's uh, transaction costs are quite high at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you really, of course, need scale for crowdfunding. But I think it's definitely the way of the future, especially when you see that individuals are actually generating return on their investments through crowdfunding. Right. So right. watch out banks, there may come a day when individuals want to look for a short-term loan that they will look at crowdfunding platforms to, to secure that. I have, I have an experience of crowdfunding. I'm on the advisory board of Chime for Change mm -hmm. from Gucci, which is, which is doing that. And uh, so you, you propose very good NGOs that should be funded, uh, if possible. And it's incredibly fast uh, how you can fund things through that. So, you know, you find easily $10,000, not millions, of course. Right. But for small sums that can make a real difference to small NGOs, small social enterprise, you can really do things with crowdfunding. And it will grow. It will grow. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And that's uh, just, just to add to the point, it's an option. And, and the good thing is, and I think the point uh, that was just made, is that you can do a lot with a little money. Yeah. And I think in sure. cases where you need a little money to yeah. drive this a really good idea, and crowdfunding is fantastic, with the exception of the transaction fees. Right. Right. <laughs> Which would come down over yeah. time. Over time and scale. Well, thank you very much indeed. It was much appreciated to have this opportunity to explore some of the trends in philanthropy. I think that almost all the points indicated that business and finance and philanthropy are increasingly coming together. Um, but I think it was particularly an opportunity to hear from um, some leading practitioners who frankly devoted their careers to very noble causes. And I'd like to ask if we can all give them a real hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.